Having a Gas is the podcast that talks the great and the good of the creative industries, and in particular finds out what makes great music for film, for TV, for commercials, for dancing to, for cooking to, for f***ing to, and more. Today I'm having a guest with Rania and Trevor Robinson. They are CEO and founder and ECD respectively of Quiet Storm. They're married and they run an initiative called Create Not Hate, which aims to get diverse thinking into our industry. And I will say uh, good morning to Rania and Trevor Robinson at Quiet Storm and at the uh, kitchen table. How's it going? Good morning. Yeah, good, thanks. Good morning. Very good. Morning. Um, Happy to be alive. Yeah, of course. And uh, I think at the moment, I would be happy to be where you are because it looks very bright. It looks like the morning, obviously, over here. It looks like the you know the middle of the night because it's the Salford sort of overcast. So, yeah. Yeah, no, this is our... This is, we fight over this spot in the morning, actually, because it's got the most light. So this is the kitchen table. And, um, yeah, the other work spot is in our front room, dining room. Yeah. And, and normally, Rana wakes up at crazy o'clock in the morning. So she's here. <laughs> so I always here. get it. Yeah. yeah, so I go into the dark doldrums next door. <laughs> yeah, you got that um, CEO get up and go four in the morning, you know, uh, quick workout and then to the desk thing going on. Yeah, overactive mind wakes me up sooner than I care. So, yeah, yeah. How has um, navigating the entire last 12 months been for you guys? Let's say, so let's start from a, an agency perspective before from a, you know, a, a, a household perspective. I think for an agency, from an agency perspective, to answer you, it's, we've been incredibly lucky um, in the fact that based on the portfolio of clients that we've got, we've got lots of food and drink, we've got a disinfectant client, um, another sort of home entertainment. In, you know, So actually, if you look at the client portfolio, they've been probably the least disrupted. In fact, they've done quite well through all of this. So it's kept us busy. Um, and then alongside that, I've just, I've been actually really surprised and sort of how good the output has been as well. We've shot stuff, we've pitched, we kind of, deli- you know, we've done everything that you would do in a normal year and the output's been really good. The process, I haven't enjoyed the process as much, if I was really honest. And I think we've all missed each other and, you know, it, that kind of, you know, camaraderie and banter and all, all the stuff that you have has made it less enjoyable. But if you had said to me, you know, a year ago, that this that we'd be working like this and it would be kind of fine. I, I wouldn't have believed it really. Yeah, so I, I yeah. thought we had a, like a three months and the wheels will fall off or something. But I, I, I think it's got a lot to do with luck. But it's a lot to do with feels like season. If anybody ever watched the The Walking Dead, it feels like season five <laughs> where. They all are like equipped at <laughs> killing zombies and moving as a team in silence and all that kind of stuff. And it felt like that's what we were, what we are now as a team. We all kind of know what our strengths are, what our weaknesses are, and we back each other up. And I think we were almost ready for the apocalypse to use it, keep on the, uh, the Armageddon pace. Yeah, I think really good point, actually. I think we were a mature team in the sense that we've all worked together for a long time. We're tight. We've been in the trenches, you know, quite so. And we've got a very strong culture. And I think that definitely helped because uh, you were in a rhythm. I, I don't know how easy it would have been if we if got lots of new people or, you know, things like that. So I think that definitely helped as well. Do you think it's harder for, uh, you know, much larger, un- unwieldy agencies with, you know, 10 different sub brands and all this stuff? I think everything's harder yeah. <laughs> when you're that size, to be honest. I don't know how they, you know, it is more of a challenge. Um, yeah. But, you know, because you have to, you need more sort of processes and systematic approaches and things like that. And, and you, it's harder to kind of um, quality control, I think, when you're at scale. You know, that yeah. those things, you know, get, get watered down, diluted. And culture can get diluted as well. I've seen, I've personally worked in a lot of very small businesses that have become really big businesses and you see what happens. It, it does change. So I think it is more of a challenge. It's not impossible. And the right, you know, there are some fantastic examples of big businesses that, you know, have got very strong culture and operate brilliantly. So I just... I, I suspect it is probably a bit harder. Yeah, I feel like, because we're quite a small business and quite new, we're only five years old. And I imagine, and you guys can probably um, confirm or deny, that there's a sense of when you're a very small business and there's about, you know, five or six of you, you, you're idealistic as you would be when you're a young person. You think, well, we're going to scale up and be, you know, this really huge, ethical, really good work. And we, 
you know, you imagine a perfect world when you're this huge thing. And is it always that once you scale up, you start to, it gets harder to maintain things, harder to keep things consistent? Well, what I would say though, because like when I started quite so off, crazy o'clock 20, 25 years ago, um, um, I really didn't know, because I didn't start off with an ambition to run an advertising agency in the first place. I did everything completely wrong. Didn't go with many clients, didn't, um, didn't have a focus of what we were as a company. And I think through the years, and especially since Ryan has joined us, it's given us, we've become more and more focused of what our strengths are, <coughs> what we're about, why we are here. I've always done stuff um, for charity work. I've always done stuff to give back. But um, I think more, moreover, Quiet Storm has got an identity now and it's easier for us to hire people, to bring people in. And it's easy for people when they come in, when they're not, fit in the bill, they kind of, they almost like everybody kind of knows and they know that, you know, it's not going to work. And I've been really amazed that um, some of our staff would, you know, be a part of the interview process and they will go, they're not quite storm. And I find that, wow, that's like, but that, I think we've done it in reverse. We've become more and more aware, self-aware the last five years. So, um, a good, a good place to start might be, because I, I feel like working backwards chronologically in this instance. Um, Rania, how long have you been working with Trevor as a team? You know, yeah, work with? I've been with the business for nine years now. So this year, this year it'll be nine years in July, yeah. So but obviously it's been going for 25 years. And I wasn't part of founding it or the, you know... Um, so yeah, but, but obviously the business has kind of changed completely really the industry's changed completely in the last nine years and therefore the business has has kind of had to change but I think as Trev said even like it's even even when I first joined I think it's still been an evolutionary process and we've sort of been honing and honing and honing um and I've got a very very strong and clear sense of who we are now you know and again that was something that took a few years because when you're really small it's very instinctive and it permeates from from the, the business leaders, if you like, um, uh, particularly if it's owner run, like like our business has been, um, it's not till you get bigger and you start you start to realise that actually this is when things need to be better defined. Mm-hmm. You are bringing people in and and you know middle management people that are in more of an influential role in the business, and you think if they're not quite right, it really does impact and you feel it and you start to see the, the culture change. And so it was at that point that we realised actually we do need to better define what we stand for so one way we think about it when we recruit we think about it when we look at people's development plans and performance and you know whether someone's right or wrong and so so yeah so I wish I'd done it sooner to be honest with you uh, because it's had it's really helped us focus and not just in terms of the people we hire but the the kind of brands we want to work with the kind of work we want to do what we want to stand for in the world and I think if you you know in this business more than anything you, you do need to be really you know you need to be distinctive and that comes from you know the heart of your DNA as a business and I think once you can define that you know you will recognize and clients and brands will recognize whether you're right for them or not and so yeah I wish I'd done it a lot earlier that'd be my advice to anyone setting up a business (laughs) or you know define what you you know what you want to stand for what you want to mean to people in the world and and you know so you it sounds like you were uh, expressing there that being clear about let's say what the soul of your business is, you know, what its personality is, is essential for attracting the right clients, but also the right talent. And yeah. so was, was, was that happening before Rania joined or was that, you know? To be honest, it was, it was really about surviving because uh, when I first started, we were more a production company. Right. Because like, when I left quite st- uh, for Hal Henry, and they were like agency of the decade, you know, they were killing it. And, um, and, but they weren't allowing me to direct my own work. And that's one of the real nuggets of why I wanted to start. And I really didn't, I really hated the them against us. They were very, they're brilliant guys, very intelligent guys, but it was very much old school based. The planners were over there, the account guys over there, the creatives never spoke to the clients unless, unless they were, were, were about to shoot something which I thought in the end was like really crazy because I'd come from being on the dole for years, trying to get into advertising. So you you spend a lot of the time trying to understand your craft, but also trying to understand how to crack a brief. 
So you became strategists, planners, without knowing it, because you're thinking about, right, what does this brand need? What are they, you know, what, what, where's a gap that we can own and stuff like that? And I thought, found that really exciting. In hindsight, when looking back, I found it really exciting. But when I got into advertising, that was stripped away from us. We never got involved with the strategy. I never thought I needed to, and we never met the client. But as time went on, I realized the client had a, such a great input on what we came up with as an idea. They were, they were an important part of accessing uniqueness and originality. So, um, yeah, so when I started Quiet Storm Up, I really wanted to have that as a part of the, the DNA and a part of the way we worked and the structure, how we work with our planners and, um, and, and how, how even we sold the work. I really wanted our creators, even though I'm the worst talker when it comes to reading out my own scripts, I absolutely hate it. I think it's a phobia from school. I hate reading things out loud. Oh, our doorbell's going there. But anyway, the kids will answer that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So basically, it was it was um, a lot of the way we started is it kind of like um, kind of set me up for being a slightly different different agency than than than, than was around mainly because we was a production company as well. Yeah. Still, some of that, that that legacy of production company hasn't left us. We've, to be honest, we we've, we've become more traditional in some ways, almost, you know, classically structured in some ways. And the fact that we've got account, more account handlers versus producers, we've got more planners, you know, it's much, in that respect, it's sort of, but what we've retained from our production company legacy is a couple of things. One is that kind of keep it lean and then bring in the right kind of talent as and when you need it, yeah. which I think is so critical now. One, so you can be agile, two, you know, just to be more bespoke and specific to, to every client's needs are different you know so that's really smart and then the other thing is having the people who come up with the ideas actually make the make the work as well and that that goes to that also goes to say with our creatives so the creatives who come up with the ideas direct them which is really unusual unless you're a content agency you know but we do that with PVCs and you know big high high big end productions so that still is quite unique and it's that we've kept that part of our DNA um which I think is, is again makes us quite distinctive and there's so many interesting things to pick up on there and certainly one is the idea that, and I was talking to Jules Chocolate Ogilvy about this as well, uh, the idea came up that if you're going to generate the ideas, uh, it really helps to also understand the craft of how they're yeah. produced. Because yeah. I don't know what the disadvantages are, and, and, and you'll be able to tell me better, of when all you do is conceptualise and then hand it over and go, well, figure it out. You know, that I imagine there'll be things either missing that you weren't aware that you could achieve, or you'll think that things are achievable that are actually a bit too ambitious for the budget or for the client. What was devastating about it, sometimes you'd spend, I don't know, a year, try to win the business in the first place. You win it, and then you move back and forth with the clients. You manage to get an idea through to make. could be sometimes six months before you're there. But you've immersed yourself with that, that business. And back in the old days, uh, this is going on a bit, but you'd have, it was very much the directors didn't like advertising particularly. They didn't want to be sullied by doing that. And, um, you know, and they were always um, aspiring to being film directors and stuff. This is even before now. People like going, um, I, I wouldn't mind doing a TV series now. Back in the day, it was like a TV series is somebody who's cutting their, you know, is, 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 is forging their, their thing, but they don't want their name on it. And the same way advertising back in the day was about making money. And I remember just seeing these... Directors strutting with their long coats, dark sunglasses out in the Matrix, Matrix which was very popular then. No, and, 99. Yeah, and they used to really... And you give them your baby, as it were, your idea, yeah. and they wouldn't understand it. I mean, I remember being on, being on the actual shoot and the director trying to work out what the script was. <laughs> And I just felt such a fool that we had given him, you know, we'd given him our idea and they didn't, he didn't even understand what he was shooting. And I thought, you know what, if anybody's going to, you know, I'm definitely not Wrigley Scott, but I would have thought, you know, I, I, I love film and I love um, coming up with ideas and I love the process of making the ideas. And I remember at the time there were people like Tarantino and, and Scorsese and then and Scorsese obviously and, and Spike Lee who were writing and directing their own work. And I was thinking, 
that is obviously what we should be about. We should be about trying to perfect your ideas and keep that escalation of 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 of, of the of the, 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 vision. Product, the, yeah, vision. the vision. Yeah. Keep that escalating as opposed mm-hmm. to going that far and then giving it to someone else. So, and if you're lucky, you get um, um, a Chris Cunningham or a um, what was his name? Um, Anyway, yeah, Spike Jones, Spike or, something, Jones or yeah. something like that, yeah, yeah. Ringan, yeah. who are talented in themselves when they can grab that idea and 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 take it up further up the hill. But sometimes you, it, it's, you it's just, a risk, yeah. isn't it? I think I think it's fair to say a good director does escalate and make an idea better, but there's a risk in that that you're not mm. always going to get that. Isn't I mean, it? but also what I used to hate was like the, the creators would be sat on the monitor with the clients by the toilets over there. And you were very much looked upon like, get out, leak, leak stay out of my way you now. I'm going to create, I'm going to take your little piece of dung and make it into, <laughs> I'm going to shine it into a diamond. And, um, and I used to hate that. And I still hate that when on production, if the crew teach each the clients badly or treat like, I really they're think, a side line, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're an important part. They've come with the journey all the way through. They should be a part of us creating this and we should as a team be able to escalate an idea you know yeah that is um that's that's as is always the case uh, a whole subject matter opens up with every uh, with every micro interaction and there uh something comes up that uh, i hear about a lot and i spoke to ben k over the summer of last year who expressed what uh, i think you were just saying trevor which is that uh at one point a lot of advertising uh, creatives, be it in the agencies or as you know, outsourced talent like directors, would be viewing what they're currently doing as a stepping stone to a greater moment for them, where they're making something more important. And I'm just working for these brands uh, for you know to make some money for now, but I'm really a playwright or something like that. You know, yeah. and it sounds like when you're doing that, you're always trying to build your own brand rather than take the clients you know, needs and, and really get uh, as if you're on their side. I, I remember, uh, I think it was an early uh, ethic of Saatchi that they said, you have to imagine that all of the inventory is yours and you have to sell it or it's your neck on the line, you know. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the other thing with being creative agency and production companies, you are fully accountable. You can't blame the production company. You can't blame an external source. You literally, you, you are fully accountable. Um but it's absolutely right. You've got, you know, I, I, we always feel like that. It's like we're spending our own money. You know, you spend it wisely and you spend it with, you know. Because um, again, it's like when you own, when it's your own business as well. It's like you're not, it's, you're not going to retain a client. You're not going to win new clients if you're not doing work that, that works that's really impactful and really effective so for us it's yeah. it's really important and that again is comes with the risk factor of handing it over to somebody else who doesn't have that relationship with client that doesn't have the kind of long-term vested interest it's just one job not really a big deal you know so yeah i think that that is another reason really to protect the relationship that we have yeah and, so and our relation. one thing i thought this would be a good uh point to jump across to create not hate because I felt like one thing that from what I understand of that uh, endeavor one thing it has in common with the with what we're discussing right now is that a lot of young people who are um, you know well a lot of people who are coming coming of age let's say they're going through that sort of mid-teens about to approach university and you know the decision you make at university and what you're going to do and pursue is very expensive from a financial perspective and a a temporal perspective, you're setting yourself down a certain path and you can always readjust. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is, I think a lot of young artistic types just aren't aware that this is a career option, that there is a place you can get, you know, literally get paid to create artwork and to create script and copy and music. And so, uh, yeah, just, you know, tell for those who don't know a little bit about what Create Not Hate is all about. Well... I mean, it's exactly what you said there. When I first came in, the industry managed to break in, and I'll backtrack up. I don't want to go on it because it can become very sprawling and rambling. But um, what, what, what I found was um, I'll be sat there in the office with me and Al just laughing, you know, as we're coming up with ideas and just... You know, we sat there in the office and it was like, you know, like just a year before we were on the dole. And then then we were there and everybody was like treating us like we were like superstars. And 
And it was easy. It was easy to come up with ideas. It was easy to be able, because we were able to tap into all the things that we'd gone on before in, in the dole and college and all that kind of thing. And then, oh, but, but I still kept thinking at any stage, the bubble was going to burst. Someone's going to kick the door off and go, get out of here. You know, you, yeah, the dream was going to come to an end, yeah. We just discovered you're, you're black. Please, can you, just, <laughs> can you leave? But um, I found it unbelievably rewarding. And, and I've had a long career, like I said, and lots of successes and managed to, you know, make clients a lot of money and, and make ourselves um, quite profitable and win awards. And most importantly, we've been able to give back a lot to lots of different projects. So for me, I really wanted other people to be able to jump on that surfboard and experience life what I've experienced and I knew this is the killer when I was growing up I knew there were guys girls a lot more intelligent than me a lot more talented than me that did not know about our industry did not know you could have a life of really rewarding creative life out there just across the river in the west end and it was like this little secret bubble this little kind of Hogwarts of advertising industry where people from where I grew up just did not know about it. Yeah. So um, I found it really frustrating, especially when I was looking at a piece of advertising that was aimed at, supposedly aimed at my community or people uh, uh, interacting with the community. And one, one of the things was, um, I remember seeing a poster talking about um, drugs and the... the um, um, how drugs affect you. And I remember it was award-winning posters, brilliant, really. And it had the, the, the different um, effects of drugs on this one woman's life yeah, as it was deteriorating. Yeah, 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 really great. That. Great award-winning ad. I knew that was not going to affect the target audience out there. Not, not at all. Because they would go, yeah, she, poor woman, that's not me. And, and forget it. So... I was aware that when we were doing things like Crime Stoppers, that you had to do things that was interactive and, and really forced their hand in terms of thinking about um, about the subject matter and thinking about and how to do it. Yeah, that's what it's yeah. So you, you have to personalise it. And I knew the best way to try and do that when it comes to talking to people is to talk to some of the people it's affected. As in, and like at the time, I wanted to use knife and gun crime. I remember that a kid had just been stabbed from my and murdered from my old school. And I thought, actually, let's go back there. Let's go there. And I think it was me, Kat Campbell, and Michelle Adjerman. And we went back to my old school. Michelle was PR, and Kat was a creative. And we went back to my old school, which was really daunting, funny enough. And I, because like I spent most of my time in advertising, I haven't really, <laughs> I'm, I'm not a teacher. I don't know how to talk to kids, much as my own. And it is just kind of like going back to my old school and had all these slouching kids, which I was just like, and they were just looking at us like, <laughs> What do you want? And I remember driving, even driving in there with my car, and I was thinking, oh, my God, I must look such a, you know, a typical ad man coming in there. And I, I kind of went back there, and we set the project. And I've got to say, it was amazing. It was an amazing experience for me, and it was amazing for a lot of, you know, like, we, I, the people that we met through the process, the kids that came up with the ideas. And what I was trying to do was not just make it a pyramid so the top people who, because we set an agenda so that we would make whatever that we come up with here. So the kids can really see it's tangible and we, we're putting our money where our mouth is and trying to make them have a taster of the industry and get them to kind of go, wow, and which, which did happen a lot. A lot yeah. of these kids were like looking around going, oh my God, this is so cool. And coming into the agency and kind of... So just to set some context, we set a brief basically, which was how would you tackle gun and knife yeah. crime through communication, through any sort of form of communication, the best idea gets made, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in the end, we kind of did did the work, um, um, made the work. It got a lot of PR. A lot of people, people were talking and were very excited about it. And um, I got, um, at the time, I co-directed it with a guy called Dennis Ganfrey, and he's gone on to um, work with Idris Elba, and, and he's in Lad is Bible, Lad now, Bible yeah. now. And I mean, but, but the thing about it was I couldn't afford to sustain it, and I was a bit naive when I just did it. I was hoping other people would go, that's a great idea. Look at all that talent we can get involved with. That. And it 
of course, it was like Branu said, it was like a little bit ahead of its time at the time. Yeah, I mean, it was 2007. I mean, the conversations that we're having now around, you know, diverse talent and, you know, uh, you know, bringing in sort of young, fresh, alternative thinking just wasn't being had back then. Um, so it was kind of way ahead of its time. We've seen, obviously, since relaunching it post um, George Floyd, that actually the industry is much, much more engaged with it and more ready, and we're getting the kind of support that, you know, um, that we were hoping to have got all those years ago. Um, yeah, how crazy is ironic that we relaunched it in this pandemic <laughs> crazy time very um you know insecure year it has been for everyone and i think we were just fueled like both me and ron was just so affected by watching that film with george floyd and i was so angry like and, like ronnie was going, I was just angry for about two three weeks where i just because i felt a lot of the stuff that happened to me through my life that i've kind of put under wraps, not you know, you suppress all that kind of stuff. You're just kind of get, getting on with your life. There's no point in dwelling on the negativities in life. But it may, allowed it to spill out, and, and I think what what we felt we got to do something. The best way we could do something was in a positive way is create not hate, yeah. and uh, and to restart that again, even in that climate, was a really important part of this year, yeah. I think. And I think for us this time we've tackled, we, we, the, the focus was anti-racism. And I think what I love about the create, the kind of the, the create not hate model concept idea is that you're bringing young people in into the industry, which is ultimately we want to get them into the industry. Yeah. But also you're tackling, and it doesn't have to be social issues. The brief could be anything to be honest with you, but it just so happens that we have been addressing social issues. And actually, you know, if you look at, I mean, the, the, you know, the bringing the young people into the industry is a longer term process. It takes time. You know, it's not going to happen overnight. But you can have a massive impact through comms and through creativity almost immediately. Like that campaign reached over 30 million people. We got support, huge amounts of media support. It went sort of stateside. And, and so, we, you know, at that level, it was having an immediate impact in terms of trying to change people's attitudes and mind and, you know, educate, um, drive more understanding around a really important issue. So it works on both of those levels. So for us, that that's really rewarding. Um, eventually, obviously, we want these young people working on, yeah. you know, I mean, like, does, baked beans or whatever, yeah. you know, just normal stuff. But, but, but there's what yeah. I thought was really important as well. This time around, um, I brought in quite a lot of um, creatives from the industry as well. And some people were just calling me out and going, look, I want to be involved. And it was so good. But I dragged people in like Dave Dyer, award-winning direct, um, creative. He was just amazing, which I didn't realise he was from a similar background as me. Paul Jordan, I did. He was like, he used to run Engine and he's, again, another really talented guy. Yeah, and, and we have Vicky McGuire. Yeah, Vicky came Loads in. of brilliant and creatives, what, yeah. What I loved about it was when, when we were in the, the room with all these kids and I could see the guys and, uh, standing around the outside, these cr- big creative directors and stuff, a little bit intimidated because there's a f- room full of, uh, of slouching kids who are a little bit nervous and just, just a like... A defensive. Yeah, a bit defensive. <laughs> and also yeah. full of hurt as well, because, like, yeah. some of the kids come in there were being stopped and searched on the way to work, work on anti-racism by the police. And, you know, and and I think there, there was this element of, oh, I'm not, not in control of this situation. But by the end of the day, these kids were beaming, the creative directors were really excited and, like, going... And also, equally, what I've been there before and I know what can happen, I know how bright these kids are and where you can end up with some amazing ideas. And But you can see the creative directors as well, like, going, wow, this is interesting, this is not just some middle class grads these ideas have come from these these kids you know yeah. there's like it's inspiring on both sides yeah. to be honest with you so it's that's like, what I really wanted yeah. I wanted I wanted the advertising industry to see the potential talent that's out there that's not just come from Oxford just not Cambridge yeah. or something it's it's not just come from yeah. Watford College you know and, you know and the work got you know pick of the week it's you know it's you know it's been highly acclaimed by the industry they're, you know they're things that people cover you know to get mm. pick of the week in campaign or so that these are young kids that had had no experience or exposure to advertising before at all of getting pick of the week in campaigns. So it's the proofs in the pudding, really. It's that is that is what we want. And there's, so there's a there's a few things that struck me um, through all that. Now one is uh, it sounds like 
if you wanted to train your account handlers properly, you get them to go talk to teenagers because they're going to be the hardest client to win over. Yeah. You can imagine. Yeah. Um, and um, the uh, in terms of the actual, you know, going to the schools and, 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 and doing this kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? Doing this kind of outreach. Uh, it is using the correct motivation to get a positive change, which is positive feedback. You know, there's excitement, there's an actual reward, there's an actual potential to do something, you know, as opposed to something vaguely inspiring, but basically still talking about uh, only the difficult, dark, and and, and uh, what would you call it, you know, unpleasant side of things. It's like, look, here is vision for a better life. Here's a moment to participate in it. And then their eyes light up and they actually get to experience it and are more likely to pursue it for that reason. So I think it, that is a very, that is, I'm really uh, glad to hear that that's actually going on. There are people doing this and as well. And very Ronnie. practical. Yeah, sorry. We, we just wanted something very practical, that, you know, you're doing. And, and for us, it was about, it's always about the work. Yes. And not just going and describing it to them and saying, well, you could maybe one day if you try, but. Yeah. You know. Well, don't forget. I mean, like, it's pointless just coming in. And I, like, I've seen people do this before where they've gone in front of these kids and go, here's my work. Yes. Here's how great I am. Here's the awards that I've won. And if you're lucky, one day you can start on the path. And, like, seven years down the line, and, like, you go, no, let's do some ideas right now. You can do it right yeah. now. And we're going to make those things. I mean, one of the, the sweetest things was... Um, one of the kids sent a picture of himself like in, yeah. in front of the poster. Really and they're proud, standing yeah. there, really, like, can't believe, you know, tears in their eyes that I've done that and it's up there. It's out in the world. It's yeah. over, you know, millions of people are looking at this. And so for me, it's instant assurance on both sides because the creatives in the industry can look at that and go, oh my God, That's kids have come up with that. And then the kids can also go, look, I've done that. Do you know what I mean? It's like I remember one of the guys as well. Um, he's he, he did one of the strongest campaigns, Emmanuel, and um, he was sat at the front of the class. And I remember it immediately he was at the front row, and he was sat there, and he was like going quite loud, so I could hear it. And he was like going, "I never want to work in advertising. It's rubbish." <laughs> <laughs> he's like sat there and he's chatting when we were doing all our yes yeah, so this is the kind of work we do and all this kind of thing he sat there laughing at me. yeah <laughs> and um by the end of the process like because his idea was um like i said was one of the best ideas and he actually went off the toilet in the thing and he panicked because when he came back the, co- the guys that he was with hadn't cracked the idea and he literally came up, and I could see it. I, I started at the back of the class and went back and getting everybody's ideas. And I knew he was so determined he would not have failed here because he knew I was looking at him, he was looking at me, and he was like, right, I'm, I'm going to show you I can do an idea. And his idea was superb, was really good. It was very simple. And even, even with him, he was thinking, this isn't big enough. It has to be bigger than, but I knew it was a, and we all knew. Um, as soon as we heard yeah, it, yeah. As soon as we heard it, we went, well, that's a good yeah. one. Anyway, but cut long short, we came back, like, at the end of the process, we did the editing and all that, looked at the film. He was sat in a reception with uh, two of his, his colleagues as well, and everybody else has left. And he goes, I don't want to leave here. This is great. I do, I do not want to leave. And I think that was the re- best reward for the whole process, because you're able to open up somebody's eyes to, yes, advertising is, is full of people that's self-important, take themselves a bit too seriously. And, you know, it's a little bit of smoke and mirrors going on in advertising, but it's also a very rewarding experience. And as you say, you can actually change people's lives with, with an idea. Yeah. You can, attitude, yeah, you can change your yeah. attitude. You can behavior. change, you know, to take on something like racism, let's face it, is a real hard job. Look at the States, it's like half of it is upside down and all Trump vision out there, which is just very disturbing in this day and age. But um, but if you can tackle something like can change one racist around by something that you, these kids, it's a really important. Yeah, and you know I thought with, as well with the, the setting of the brief, um, and particularly with the the brief that you were discussing, where you said you know how would you tackle gun and knife crime? I think there's actually a very important uh, psychological aspect to that, which is um, 
you know, there's a sort of classical idea that the weight of the world rests on the shoulders of each individual, you know, and you, if you, if you really put your back to it, you could actually change things for the better. And what I liked about this was uh, it's taking a very complex and abstract problem. How would you tackle gun and knife crime and get these kids for maybe an hour or two hours to think about how to do it. It gets them in the mindset of actually I could do something about things that I didn't think I could affect, yeah. you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And also these are the kids that are living with it. You know, they're living with it. You know, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the camp these campaigns are coming out from people that have got no experience of this stuff. They're not living it every day. And it's so the insights, that real insight's just not not there. And the sensitivities and the cultural understanding. And so yeah, it, you you you've got the people that really do get it also working with much more powerful. Yeah. And it's like um, as, as 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 Trevor alluded to before. Um, if uh, something when Richard Huntington was on this podcast, he was talking about the inevitable drive towards orthodoxy and always trying to fight against that. And one thing, and we talked about this with Dave Dye as well, that if you only have your new starters in the creative department or wherever, having come from Hounslow or Watford or places where they teach yeah. advertising, yeah. essentially what you will end up with is a load of work that all looks like you expect advertising to look like. That's, that's really what um, I'm hearing again and again from people. But I think everybody's always had a love hate, hate relationship with advertising. But I, we have grown up in, I think, I've grown up with, you know, the Heineken campaign, the Hamlet campaigns, the, you know, the Guardian ad, you know, with the, the skinhead and stuff like that. I've grown up in, you know, the horses, um, Guinness yes. horses and all that. Well, I've, I've been a part of and seen some great pieces of advertising. Um, and I was, I felt very much inspired. And you look around now and you kind of go, but it was more diverse struggle. then, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. If you look at oh, the yeah, people coming the in people there, the people coming in, yeah, was working, like, yeah, working class. Yeah, Tom, and, yeah. Tom and Walt were like, Walt was from Ireland. Um, Walt, uh, Tom was like, a, you know, street kid like me and, and kind of like, and just also, what, they wanted to shake things up and felt, I remember Tom working with Tom late one night and we just all working on our portfolios. And Tom was like going, these guys don't even know the geniuses that's in this room. Do you know what I mean? And Tom used to, we used to create these little, you know, fake ads and stuff. And Tom would stick them underneath the desks of the creators that were working there. And they go, these guys don't even know there's the best ordering in the ad underneath their own desks. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to, what I loved about Tom and loved about all those guys and all of us, Dave Dyer was a part of it. And it was, um, you really thought we can shake things up. There was this monopoly before and now we're here to shake this up. And I think the problem now, it just feels like everybody's from the same, like yeah. you said, same melting pot. Yeah. Same. Well, back then you could sort of work your way up from the post room yeah. or as a runner or as, you know, or you got a secretary. That's how I, I kept going to these. I went in as a secretary. Whereas the, those roles just don't exist anymore. It's, it's grads. It's like the only way in is a shortlisting process. What university did you go to? What kind of degree have you got? And and so you're, you're you're getting the same kind of people. Whereas back then, it's become less progressive. I mean, we're now trying to get back to that now. And I think there's a recognition we need that diversity. But there was, there's been a big period of, you know, the same kind of people coming into the industry. So Yeah, when I spoke to uh, Paul Burke about this subject, he reflected one thing that you just mentioned, which is that he started as a van driver for AMV. Yeah. And eventually became a writer. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, we, you know, when you end up uh, sort of accidentally uh, having an agreement with someone you would consider an enemy or certainly an opposition. And uh, we said, is this advertising calling for Dominic Cummings misfits and weirdos again? You know, mm. uh, because I, mean, I think that's interesting because you didn't know it at the time. I mean, it just happened to be um, you looked around and you went, wow, you're a bit more like me. Da, 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 da. And I, obviously, not so much, and even then, I thought I thought there was seemed to be more black people in, the, you know, like Roy Antoine. There was a few more. I used to look around the floor and, and, and advertising and go, "Oh well, maybe the industries, um, their award shows," and then you'd see a few black faces and then you go like that. And so that was a really disappointing for me to see that kind of just dwindle and it's not move that much further. But I think it really does. I, I think. It's a positive thing that there's more women now in senior positions in, 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 in advertising than when I first came in. Um, but 
I really think we need to address the balance in terms of culture and in terms of people that are different and yeah, yeah. different backgrounds just to shake things up and to really throw the net out there because there's so much talent out there that aren't like we said earlier that aren't in the industry yeah. and that going they're not off drawn to, to it yeah. they're not attracted they don't to even, it they don't either even, even if they do know about it they're a bit like actually why would I want to join yeah. that industry it's not for me or it's not, there's not people like me in it or I, you know so there's both of those barriers there's yeah. an awareness and an actually relevant yeah, that's it, isn't it? Because talent is sort of randomly dispersed and doesn't reside within a specific group. And so the obvious point to be made is if we have more of a specific group than others, we're going to be missing out on loads and loads of talent. And, you know, I, yeah, I don't know um, what it is. I'm, I'm 28, so what I'm realising is that it catches up with you way sooner than you realise, that, you know, you're a teenager one minute and then the door slams shut behind you and you don't understand what's going on down there anymore. And so I don't know what uh, teenagers in my city or in London are actually aspiring to be and aspiring to look like. And, you know, if there's any place for their aspirations in advertising, you know, how you could make it appealing. I think it's so important to, to really look towards teenage youngsters for the answers as well, rather than us looking down and full yeah. of you, dear yeah. boy, and you, you will be good. And I think it goes both ways. And yeah. I especially like working at Quiet Storm with young creative talents that we have there because they're rejuvenating. They're really, they, you know, some of the things they say on that, I was about when we were on Create Not Hate as well, kids were talking about these platforms and all that. I was going, what? What's this? <laughs> and we were like looking around at each other, some of us, like, going, what are they on about? Do you know what I mean? Just yeah. did not know. And that's what's really good. They're educating us and bringing us in. And this is, and you go, oh, that's what that is. And, you know, and I think creativity is all about that. It's all about that lab where we all spark off each other and we escalate ideas together and we all push each other. And the older ones can come with, yes, a bit of wisdom, wisdom and a bit of, yeah. A bit of craft, a bit of style, and know how to sell an idea. Uh, and then the youngsters can come in and just knock you sideways with a, with a, an idea you just did not see coming. So um, it's 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 so important that we don't all just because I always thought you have to you know you have to get price and you have to get these. I remember seeing these creators with their awards and them and their posters up and you know and their articles all about themselves. And it is almost that kind of like you're not able to talk until you have all this. Yes. And I think that's that's a problem because by the time you have all this, you like you said, the door's shut and you're 28. <laughs> Even though I'd love to be 28 now. <laughs> yeah. One thing that on that very note, Rania indicated in our little prepar preparatory discussion was that there may even be a move to include, um, uh, what would you call it? Some discussion about retaining people over a certain age in the industry because uh, the... Mm, what would you say? Not paranoid, but yeah, let's let's go with that for want of a better word. The paranoid side of me says, is it just because once you get to a certain level of experience, number of awards, et cetera, et cetera, you become a very expensive asset for a holding company to retain. And so it's like, well, do we need to pay this person 200 grand or should we just have two juniors do the same work for less? I don't know. I'm just... I think there's a couple of things. Definitely it's a cost thing because if you're trying to, you know, if you're trying to cut a ton of overhead, like the cost off your bottom line, you look to the most expensive people. I think it's partly that, but I think it's partly an ageist attitude within our industry that older people just aren't on the money. They're not fresh. They don't know what's cool. They don't know what's what. And, and I think for us, we always joke about there's a few of us that bring our average age up because we've got a few people over 50 in our agency. But, you know, that is exactly as Trev said, you need both. You need that kind of wisdom that you only get through years and years and years of craft and knowledge working alongside this fresh. And that's when it, you hit the sweet spot. I think it's absolutely right that one without the other, you, you, you probably got some weaknesses going on because you do need experience. You know, it just it, you can't discard years and years of experience. But I think a lot of businesses just clear those very expensive people out um, and that and it's partly that and I think it's partly disillusionment burnout as well I think there's people probably exiting as well that, that are kind of you know burnt out and just a bit over it and I'm sure that that's also happening there's a number of things but um, that play into it but no from our perspective you, you need diversity is diversity it means across the board it's not one thing it's a range of things yes um, but I think the, the telling thing is I was at a will do around people two years ago and um 
And I, I was seeing, I, I, I know Vicky won't mind me saying this, but Vicky was picking up a lot of awards for Grays. And I was like, thinking, Jesus Christ. And I wasn't really paying attention. I was drinking and all that kind of stuff, trying to get through the night. And um, Vicky was strolling up and picking up all these awards. I was saying, Jesus Christ, Pick, Vicky's been prolific. And I realised she's picking up awards for the creators that weren't there, that had been let go. So Mark Reddy, all these different guys had, had won all this, and they're old, old dudes, and they just chopped off, and they were award-winning, you know. The ideas were killer, really brilliant. That's some of the work that the, the guys had, and they had been just let go. So I, I just don't think it's a, a fallacy to kind of think that if you're older, you're dried up, so therefore you no longer can produce the goods. You're no longer... Talent, talent doesn't go anywhere. Enthusiasm might go, like Ryan says. But talent doesn't go in, and like, and if you're if you have fought your way to the top of the mound, as it were, in advertising based on the strength of your creativity, that should not be chucked out. You know, that should be harnessed. That should be able to be utilised. Yes, we cost more if you're older. Yes, you know, because you've you know, you've won awards, yeah, you've won awards things, and all yeah. that kind of thing, and you feel you should be paid. But people should be smart. You should look at a village. <laughs> structure and go look the old the people elders, yeah, yeah they're, they're there they're there giving wisdom to the young and making the tribe stronger and that's what advertising industry needs to get their head around it's very simple in fact yeah when i spoke to um uh, steve harrison last summer we were talking about the if if you accept the axiom that only people from a certain demographic can speak to people of a certain demographic because they understand their experiences and that might be true um, then why are we always trying to sell uh, cars using people who are about my age or in their early 30s when the average age of a first-time buyer of a car is 54? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And actually, that's some of the, you know, you know, over 50s have got the most disposable income. Exactly. It's a huge market. It's a massive market. And they're aging and there's more of them. And, you know, there's a lot of millions of reasons why. And I think, you know, what a good, 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 you know, good marketing is that you, you can empathise and you can get into the understanding of the people you're talking to, whether you are from that demographic or not. But really, you get there a lot quicker if you can relate. Instinctively. Cool. You know that. And, you know, we don't have much time these days to do huge amounts of insight and analysis and going out to talk to people. So, you know, to have a group of people that can relate immediately in instinctively is there's something to be said for that yeah so we've got about 10 minutes left and you know i i have to get some music out of you guys at some point and so one thing i thought i might start with is saying you know what are you both is there anything you're listening to a lot at the moment or is there anything that's helped you get through the last year well, I, I, Trevor's going to be more like, like from a music point of view, Trevor's definitely going to have a lot more to say than me. But, I, you know, I will, my kids joke about the fact that I just play Beyonce Lemonade on repeat. <laughs> I mean, that's not a bad album. Oh, I just it's love really yeah, anything Beyonce, basically. So I've got, to be fair, I've got less a less sophisticated and broad music palette. Um, but for me, it's like anything Beyonce it just makes me happy. Yeah. yeah. I think the problem would be because, like, I live on Spotify. I always have to have music on, and and I'm always like, and I'm lucky with my all my mates. It's about twelve of us on um, on WhatsApp group, and we've helped each other get through it, and with the, you know, just meet, meeting up online and just chatting rubbish, and and just. But one of the key things is a few of them are like Nahal uh, Afanike, who's a famous. Radio One presenter, but he he's always putting his playlists on. Rao Shah who runs Exposure and Tim Bourne. They they all put on their playlists um, just brilliant music. And uh, Paul Caffel, he's a teacher, and he, he kind of he they, we just and I just nick their idea their music. I just kind of put them on my little playlist, and it keeps me going. And um, so often I don't even know. Like it's my my children who go, so, Dad, what's that? My son will come down the eldest one will go like that's a wicked who's this new guy and it was this old remix of Old Dirty Bastard <laughs> and um, there's a remix of Old Dirty Bastard and Buster Rhymes and my son thought it was a brand new track and he was like going, this is brilliant and he was saying I was pretty sure Old Dirty Bastard's dead how come he's releasing all these tracks I said he is dead it's just, <laughs> a, little, it's just a, a track that you've probably never heard of you know And um, so I, I get I'm, I'm made to think about music 
through my kids a lot and actually who are the um who are the, the, the artists that's named like my, my son has just done a playlist and half of it is the theme tunes to um um west westworld westworld and because he loves that sort of operatic um kind of piano based kind of music and it's just quite inspiring i think with when you um you kind of see it through the eyes of of your kids my son uh, Reese always says that you got me into music because you every time I got in the car you were just like put on these playlists and this crazy music and I've got a very diverse taste probably because of what I do in the industry but I think I've always been a bit like that I've I've liked everything from Black Aura to the Pixies so you know um, I'm I'm kind of all over the place yeah and of course uh, you guys from a, a music and advertising perspective uh, are um, the custodians of a brand that has probably the most well-embedded sonic brand of the last sort of 25 years with Haribo, you know, that's... Uh, we we tried to change that so many times. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're just like... Rock band. Rock band was a breakthrough for yeah, us, wasn't rock it? Band, Rocking we, up the jingle. Yeah, we got to rock, yeah. rock up the jingle and we've tried to do it every time and they're, they're very kind of like... Um, yeah, they, they 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 feel it's such an integral part, and I I think we've managed to turn it around that people don't want to slit their own throats when they hear it now because <laughs> I think people like the commercial so much they kind of and relate to them so much they kind of it's now greeted with a little bit of noddy head kind of I I am but I'm, but I remember doing a few groups and people just going you know I will pull my teeth out if I hear that jingle again <laughs> and it's, it's quite it's it used to get a real negative feedback but it's I think it's because uh, the, the commercials are so well we know I mean we do know how powerful sonic bonding is and I think you know um, it is always tempting to kind of try and change things like that but I, I do I can understand why a brand would be very attached to something that is so iconic yeah. I think what you've got to do is imbue positivity into it because yeah. that's like any identity and any branding it's you know it you you put meaning into it it's not the other way around so um yeah so yeah. I'm, I'm if they probably, hate yeah. hate the commercials yeah. and then they've yeah. got this thing yeah. it does make people want to throw themselves down the stairs yeah yeah which is not ideal if you're trying to you know no no Sweets, no. No. no, I've had that reaction before <laughs> from mates saying, if I see your commercial on again, I will find the guy in it and kill him. <laughs> so, it's quite funny. We had this, um, we, we've been watching an advert recently for this presentation we mentioned um, last week. I mentioned to you, Ronnie, before we recorded, actually. Um, and uh, it was uh, an Apple commercial. It was, you know, the iPhone Pro and the iPhone Mini or something like that. And one thing we noticed was um, Apple's music strategy, but, you know, in terms of the tracks they pick, is really, really... <laughs> really peeved off around and she's left. Oh, I'm joking. <laughs> she's gone to get the door. Go on. <laughs> Mentioning <laughs> Apple while we're talking about Harry Bob. Yeah, go on. <laughs> um, yeah uh, so the music choices for them are always so effective that it drives people back to the ad over and over again. So if you go on the Remy Wolf Apple advert, we notice that all of the comments are, I love this song so much. I keep coming back to this ad to listen to this song. And so I think there's really something for, you know, brands to pay attention to there. If you get the music absolutely right, people yeah. will drive engagement. Oh my God, that's been such a frustration for me because most of the times you'd pick, a, you know, for a mood film, for instance, you'd pick a track that yeah. is just the perfect track and go, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you get there and the client goes, quite rightly, we don't have the money for this. Do you know what I mean? We're going to have to do a little rip-off vibe or, or something, or a lesser tune. And when you see commercials, again, going back to the Guinness one and using that, um, what was it? Um, it was the... Yeah, yeah. Was it funny? Yeah, uh, left field. We did. Left we did. Field. It was in our. It was in our presentation on Friday. Oh my god! And I remember when that. I thought the music, the the you know the direction, the concept, everything. And then when that soundtrack dropped in, you could be in the kitchen making your cup of tea, and that dum 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 that beat coming in, and you just go, "You bastards!" You know, you just think, "Oh, that is such a killer." On on top of it, it's got a killer track. Yeah, you know? we we were trying to analyze that piece of work last week to figure out you know, why it's working. Because that was the request. It's like, can you come and present to us for an hour and tell us why music works when it does? Yeah. And so we basically, you know, we pull it apart and get all of the elements lined up. And so we were watching the Fat Planet thing and we were saying, of course, it's basically, it starts down here. 
and then it just rises and rises and rises. And it's obviously, it's like a wave. It's like yeah. the wave that they're waiting for. And it's like the Guinness settling. Yeah. Like, oh, that's amazing. They got the track selection, the creative idea, and the product all completely harmonious, all working together. They're all things that slowly rise. And yeah, like the weight. Like a perfect movie. You know, you just kind of, when they come along, when that Jaws comes along, and it's just, it's just the perfect. <clears throat> aligning of everything actors direction cast everything um and i think that commercial is like one of the best and it was also allowed to which always makes me laugh with tom and Watt, where it was back in the day where they went the, the directors um blazer had done this cut and it was a perfect cut and they and it they, they i think they had originally 40 or 60 i can't remember what it was and then they go no no it's going to be this length because that's the perfect cut. That's exactly right. And they got the media and got the client and everybody just bought into it and made it and put it on air. Unsullied. It's kind of felt, wow. That's the, uh, again, you know, preserving true creativity when it's like, no, no, but the media, the media slots say 30, 40 or 60. Compromise is perfect. Yeah. yeah. And I think, unfortunately, we do, there is more compromise these days. Um, understandably, you know, the budgets aren't there and whatever else, but... But yeah, it, you, you're tending to kind of work with with, with restraints rather than yeah. let the I mean, I, I really understand it, but at the same time, you kind of go if you want to make the most impactful statement out there, you've got to give the idea a chance. And if you cut away the time of the idea just to fit into a slot, and then the idea is lesser idea, so therefore it's not selling hard, isn't it? So it's, to me, yeah. it's a, a weird com- a weird equation. But we always lose. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, hey, it's 9.59. So I think there's probably work to do for you guys. And uh, <laughs> and we didn't even get onto the subject of, you know, managing uh, living together as well as running the place together. So maybe there's an opportunity for sort of Adland Mr. and Mrs. next year, you know. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah if we're still alive, then you might be good by then. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so um, ten years, I think it'll be all right. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, yeah, I'll look forward to the next one. It's been a great uh, discussion. Um, you know, keep us updated with uh, everything exciting that's going on with Creating Not Hate and with Quiet Storm. And uh, hopefully, you know, we will see you in your great city when we can next be down there. Yeah, that'd be lovely. Maybe we could see you in person. That would be nice, wouldn't it? It would be a fine thing, wouldn't it? So, um, hey, have a great day, and we'll speak again soon. Thank you. Right, take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.